morning. Thank you for coming on a, early on a Monday morning. Uh, our guests here flew in yesterday afternoon, all of them, uh, just, just for this occasion, and they're flying straight back after this because they're all uh, very busy people. And um, that's also one of the reasons we invited all three of them, because they're not only able to analyze uh, how things are going in Malaysia, but also they are, they are uh, central players in the new mass media scene that is growing in Malaysia. Now, uh, let me say a few words first about the title itself. We call it New Media and a New Malaysia. But of course, it's not new always. Uh, it's new old. Malaysia is new old, the mass media even. And the media we're going to talk about are not all new media, the way we understand them to be electronic and all that. Uh, but uh, some of our, our guests actually deal with print media. And um, Ezra Said deals with radio. That's, that's a very old media. But it's, it's being used in a new way uh, in the age of the internet and um, amid certain restrictions. Um, so that's, um, that's what's important, I think, about the talk today, that our speakers are actually, actually players. They're the ones actually uh, pushing, pushing the envelope, I think. I would, I, I'm not exaggerating. I think all of them are doing that. Um, we will start by uh, going from my left to right, three speakers. They'll speak for about 20 minutes, and then we'll have close to an hour of Q&A. &A. So let me introduce them first. I think most of you would know about them. Um, to my left here is Mr. Wan Hamidi Hamid, who is the editor-in-chief for Rocket Publications. As you know, Rocket Publications is the, it belongs to the DAP, the, the opposition party. And uh, Wan Hamidi is a member has been a member for quite a few years now, I think. And he is also running the Malay edition of the Rocket, um, Rocket Kini. Uh, and they, they're recently revamped, I think. Right? Um, now, Wan Hamidi is an old journalist, just like uh, uh, Jabba here. Uh, they started out together, actually, in New Straits Times. So there's, there's a certain area in Malaysian, the Malaysian mass media scene where certain people are nurtured and then 20, 30 years down the road, you get troublemakers like them. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, immediately to my right here is Jabas Sadiq, who is the CEO of the Malaysian Insider. I'm sure most of you, or all of you who are interested in Malaysian politics and other things, will visit that every day. I hear that they are, the hits are increasing by the day. I think they're over a million a day now. Um, even by noon, uh, you reach half a million, I think, right? Yeah. Um, and because it's free, unlike Malaysia Kini, it, it uh, draws, draws the, the uh, what shall I call it, the, the walk-in, the click-in, what do you call them? The click-in visitor, quite a lot of that. And, and so I wouldn't need to say that, but the Malaysian insider does decide um, political discourse, I think, quite a bit. Um, lately, the, the uh, book on, um, on Abdullah Badawi that is edited by one of our visiting fellows, James Jean, who's sitting here, caused quite a lot of uh, you know, controversy. And it's, so the book is selling very well. The printers can't keep up. And all that thanks to, to the media like, like these. Well, it is, it is the fastest growing news portal, TMI as it's called, the Malaysian Insider. And um, Zaba has been a journalist for a long time now, working in all, all the media, right? Yeah. Newswire, television, radio, the internet, you name it. Um, and he was senior producer with Reuters Television as well, um, for quite a long time, over 10 years. And that means interviewing all sorts of world leaders, captains of industry, from Afghanistan to East Timor, as he says here. Um, and as I said, he started in New Straits Times and Business Times as well. Far to my right is uh, Ezra Said, who is um, well, very well known to the young crowd uh, for various reasons. He, he is well, sort of a DJ, right? Is that the right word? <laughs> it, well, that's what the kids use, the DJ. But yeah, uh, DJ. radio presenter works as well. Okay, <laughs> radio presenter. And uh, he, he does a series on YouTube that uh, all of you should definitely visit if you want to, um, 
to have a more comical angle to to Malaysian politics and things like that. The effing show, the effing show can be can be uh, accessed on YouTube. How often do you do you, does that come out, Desran? Um, it used to be a weekly series, mm -hmm. uh, but between work court appearances and <clears throat> all the like, we've tried to keep it about twice a month. But uh, over the past three years, it's about close to a hundred episodes now. Yeah. Oh, I see. Uh, so, um, yeah, I would I would uh, invite all of you to to look that up. Easily found on YouTube. Um, now, Ezra is works on BFM eighty nine point nine. It's a radio station broadcast only in the Klang Valley, I think, sadly. Um, but it's it's making a splash, of course. And BFM, I think, is um, you know it's seen as one of the the liberal voices. Uh, uh, all three of our our guests here, I would say, are well trying to expand the public sphere in Malaysia, especially in the Klang Valley. Okay, so I'll I'll stop there by way of introduction, and uh, we'll start the seminar, the panel, uh, with Wan Hamidi to my left, who will talk about the dynamics of racialized media coverage in Malaysia. Hi and <coughs> good morning. Um, before we go into the new media, let's talk about the old media first. Um, <coughs> let's start with the boring parts first. Uh, this is just a background and, and I'm trying to put the context here of our discussion today. So basically, uh, if it sounds familiar, uh, nothing to do with me, okay? That uh, in the case that uh, Malaysian media are basically controlled by the government directly. <laughs> Uh, uh, let's say by, by state-owned uh, RTM, Radio Television Malaysia, and ownership by <coughs> any one of the ruling parties as well as uh, proxy private company. And indirectly controlled by laws such as the Printing Presses and Publications Act, the Official Secrets Act, as well as the Sedition Act. Okay? Uh, uh, I'm going to talk about two things here first, who owns what, and later legislation. This will be a short one, don't worry. Okay? Uh, in terms of uh, ownership, okay, um, Media Prima. This one I quote from its own website. Media Prima currently owns 100% equity interest in TV3, 8TV, NTV7, and TV9, and owns more than 98% equity in New Straits Times Press Malaysia that produce this. New Straits Times, Berita Harian, and Harian Metro, and owns three radio networks, Fly FM, Hot FM, One FM, you name it, and many, many other things. Okay, Utusan Melayu Group owns the Utusan Malaysia, uh, which for me, okay, I'm biased now, okay, because I work with the Rocket, um, which uh, we call them the, uh, what they call it, official organ of AMNO. If only, uh, what they call it, Utusan is given the same condition like ours, uh, the rocket, haraka, all these uh, party organ um, are only allowed, you know, uh, let's say for the rocket, only twice a month. Uh, haraka, uh, you, you can ask for permission, but they will decide. Haraka, I think, is twice a week. Uh, so with that kind of condition, and you have to print on top there for members only. So at any time, you can go to any bookshop, magazine shop, and then just uh, they can just confiscate that because they say, you are selling to non-members. Of course, you can argue that how do you know they are not non-members? Okay, that's beside the point. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, my focus is uh, basically on the Malay media here. Okay, I'm not saying that you know that that, that non-Malay media, English media, Chinese media are not owned directly or indirectly, but the focus here is on the Malay media because we are going to talk about the racialized media coverage, especially during the recent general election. Uh, legislation, uh, I think some of you might have known about printing presses, uh, sorry, uh, printing presses and publications act. Uh, Prime Minister Najib did um, abolish certain section when he abolished the ISA, together with the ISA, uh, that uh, in Malaysia you do not, uh, you, you are no longer required to uh, renew your license annually, but the minister still has the full power to give you a license or not, okay, and can revoke at any time he wants to, 
well, in a similar case that recently the minister can just strip off someone's uh, the, what do you call that? PR status, just like that. Um, I don't know whether they can be challenged in court or not, but that's again another different matter. Uh, the other one is the Official Secrets Act. 1972, which was amended during Mahathir era in 1986 uh, to classify, you know, top secret, secret, whatever. And then the Sedition Act, which usually, uh, despite the intention to 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 to, to what kind handle uh, issues deemed as sensitive, such as racial and religious issues, uh, yet the minister has the full power to decide what is sensitive and what is not. Okay, all right. So, in the case of the recent general election, uh, well, actually since nine two thousand eight. Okay, the situation is like this. Um, this one is in in in, in uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, in context with uh, DAP's performance in and and uh, the rest of the opposition, then later formed as Pakatan Rakyat. Uh, the performance of 2008 that you know you won four five states and then you you for the first time denied the two thirds majority in, in in the parliament since the 69. Uh, what happened was that to Amno and its voice of Utusan TV3 and all that it was a shocking experience for them because you know that that kind of success from from Pakatan and then the idea that when you see DAP can finally uh, what do you call that, uh, uh, reach out to the Malays, although well, not that many Malays, because for the last 40 years, been demonized as a Chinese chauvinist party. Okay? It rhymes, eh? Chinese chauvinist. You never call Malay chauvinist or Indian chauvinist, always Chinese chauvinist. Okay? No, seriously. Okay? <laughs> they go on that, on that line. Okay? Sometimes they add another communist word there. Okay? Uh, despite the fact historically, you know, the AP was a staunch anti-communist party. Maybe the communist one was really the Labour Party, but never mind that. Uh, logic <laughs> does not apply there. Um, okay. So <clears throat> the reason why the focus uh, and the the the, the what correct the the, the the intention of of the the ruling Amno Amno BN uh, BN being Barisan National is that the Malays being the majority race, sixty uh, percent I think. So therefore. Uh, the government, BN government, must ensure that this majority ethnic group only read, listen, watch news, view from one source only. The idea is that if you allow the Malays to to accept there is another alternative that you know uh, there is democracy. Uh, I mean, the, there is a democratic party, for example, like PKR, uh, Parti Kadal or, or DAP then automatically there is no need to hold on to the party that only protect your own race. So the idea is that if the Malays accept DAP, that will be the end of race-based politics in Malaysia. So that's why, especially uh, post-2008, Otosan, which I think some of the ideas used by TV3, which is more powerful than, than the uh, print media, eh, is to continue to harp on that issue. You vote Amno out, that's the end of the Malays. Okay? And that theme, carry on and especially during the, the general election it went all out okay it's not about this party against that party but if you do not vote for this amno bn party that basically you know the end of of, of malay the end of islam the end of everything okay uh, reason were not usually given it's just uh, i wanted to use the word rhetoric but sometimes we are vilifying that nice word called rhetoric but never mind uh, so, what happened was that news and propaganda or, 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 or publicity or whatever, you cannot differentiate anymore. Okay, and of course, uh, there is no such thing as a caretaker government in practice in Malaysia during any elections. So, throughout these uh, <coughs> general, uh, 13th general election, the last one, Okay, this, uh, okay, I, I was there to, uh, most of the time in, in Johor uh, to help the AP campaign uh, with, with, uh, and also a bit in KL. So I can see for myself what, what happened and also, you know, uh, you, you read the paper, you have to read the paper, although you, you just cannot stand the content because part of my job. So you see the trend here, okay? 
basically uh, with the utusan berita harian TV3 RTM the focus is basically fear and threats okay it may sound repetitive I have to, to read out here because it's, it's uh, in better context uh, fear and threats uh, i.e. if Malays vote for the opposition that will be the end of the Malay race that will also mean the minority Chinese led DAP will rule the country hence will destroy Islam and the Malay race okay B Malay or slash Amno hegemony. Okay, therefore, the only way to ensure the future of the Malays, they must continue to vote for Barisan Nasional. And in the media, uh, Malay media, non-existence of the opposition. Okay, the only time the opposition were mentioned is just the usual demonization of them. Okay, there is not even a single positive news except in Sinar Harian. But Sinar Harian is not a main player yet, and it has no in in, in depth analysis. Uh, despite what I might say about uh, Utusan, they are quite good in, in their analysis uh, of, of news, although it is extremely racial in nature. And of course, the, the offering of goodies uh, with what our Bantuan Rakyat Satu Malaysia and all that, so uh, it's, it's highlighted as a campaign material, uh, not just in the Malay media, but in, in even English and Chinese media. Uh, it's actually against election laws, but when the election commission say it's okay, so what can we do? And yeah, again, racial and racist in nature, the demonization of DAP as a Chinese bogeyman whose existence is only to destroy Malays and Islam. You can see that in news reporting, uh, uh, quoting uh, I'm no politician, uh, letters to the editors, uh, I don't know whether it's real letters or not, you know, but, but you have this kind of thing, I mean, linking DAP with Oh, uh, on, on, on the one hand, DAP want to bring up communism. On the other hand, DAP wants to form a Christian state. On the other hand, DAP sent Malay uh, to be trained by Israel. It, you know, it's those kind of things. It appears in a paper and we cannot reply. There is no right of reply at all. So that's the pro problem. So <laughs> the impact is that, okay, perhaps short-term game for AMNO is to ensure you know, its leaders control the politics uh, of Malaysia. Okay, but for me, you know, after being what more than a quarter of a century like Jahaba and reporting, I mean, I've been on, on the other side. I've never worked with Utusan, but I have worked with Berita Harian, with the Star, the Sun. I, I know how, how it works, I mean, how, how things work there. So, the thing is that for the past 30 years or maybe more, uh, meaning that there, 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 there's bound to be Malays who, who start to believe uh, all this uh, propaganda thing as real. And because, well, despite the fact uh, that many people, including the Malays, have Facebook, Twitter, and all that, but it's just used for gossip entertainment thing because, you know, maybe politics is too heavy, or even the kind of politics is either this side good, that side bad. You know, there, there's no serious debate, serious thinking. And of course, I'm, I don't blame the, the government for that because it's sometimes by choice, but the idea is that if you're surrounded by this kind of media, there's not much outlet for, for you to, to even, you know, uh, the debate thing uh, rationally. Uh, and then lately, uh, I don't know, maybe we, uh, we in, in Malaysia is becoming too sensitive. You, you can't do this, you can't do that. Everything is insulting to this group, to that group. So, if, if you follow the news about Malaysia, you know, um, you can just resurrect a three-year-old uh, YouTube clip about a woman and her dog, you know, because she loves her dog so much, but people are complaining, you know, uh, oh, but the background has the Islamic prayer call, and then she's a Muslim, she shouldn't do that, that kind of thing, and then, you know, uh, the thing is that it's immediately being called in by authorities, you know, and all well, the recent one, the, 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 the prayer room, designated as a surau, uh, you know, and then being used by a Buddhist group for meditation, so people get upset over that, and the minister just revoked the, the, the PR status of, of the tour operator, and then it seems that the surau is going to be demolished because uh, pointing the wrong way for the, the Kaaba, the Muslim prayer site, so it's kind of strange, but yeah, we, that's the, 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 the era we are living <laughs> in uh, right now. Um, but uh, my, my point here is that um, with all this kind of media coverage and discussion and, and debate uh, is around that who's more racial, 
who should be the champion of the Malay and, and Islam. So it's, it's the question of the young, younger generation because it seems that the Mandika Centre uh, survey found out that actually there are many slightly more young Malays voted for Amno BN. So and then you start to realize what well, perhaps they're angry with, with Amno BN, but they, the way the media are reporting, they say that okay, we are Malays, we don't mind voting for the opposition, let's say um, PAS or, or PKR, but they will be manipulated by DAP or Chinese party. It cannot be. So, so that's the problem that, that we face. Um, there's one example I want to share with you. Uh, okay, recently, okay, uh, former Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew mentioned something about you know, uh, Pakatan Rakyat in, 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 in Malaysia, not serious, cannot do the thing. So Pakatan Rakyat people got upset and issued a statement. You know, uh, the AP chairman, Karpal Singh, issued not saying that, you know, uh, Mr. Lee didn't know the, the current issues and all that. So basically, for Rocket Kini, we highlighted saying that uh, DAP criticized Lee Kuan Yew, criticized PAP. And then you see some of the comments that in Malay, you assume the Malay, a Malay guy wrote that. Okay, uh, be careful, this is a trick. You see, DAP and PAP are playing politics, very dangerous. Cannot trust them, they are Chinese. So you have this kind of response. So whatever you do, there's always uh, a trick somewhere. So it's always that racial thing. So uh, that's the problem when you're being fed with kind of, 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 of news, you know, or propaganda pretending to be, to be news in, 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 in Utusan. Yes, you may argue that, okay, maybe people don't read Utusan so much. I, I noticed that so. But the idea in Utusan has become sort of a, a, an official script for TV3 RTM. So this TV program news or the morning show for housewife or whatever is... is being, I think, watched by millions. And personal uh, campaign experience in, in Johor, for example, is kind of difficult, okay? In fact, for us DAP, when you go to a kampong area and then give our leaflet, and the Malays accepted that, that is a success for us. Because five or six years ago, you can't even do that. You can't even go into the, the village area because, you know, I mean, don't bother with this party, they only fight for the Chinese. And in fact, I think what the media is trying to do is to reduce that, meaning that if you can reduce the status of DAP to just being a Chinese party like MCA, so it's okay. Okay, so meaning that you play, you know, that, that kind of second class politics, don't get involved, okay? And that's why after the election, Utusan can come out with the big headline, Apalagi China Mao. What more do the Chinese want? Because we have given you everything. Uh, that's the argument. Okay, uh, just show you some of the photocopies. Uh, sorry, I don't know how to use PowerPoint, so uh, <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> so it's like two years ago, this kind of thing. Okay, so DAP wants to turn uh, to make uh, Christianity the state religion. Okay, it's nonsensical, never proven. Uh, uh, Lim Guaning, the uh, Secretary General, did uh, uh, sue to Sun and, and won. And okay, one, two, three, four. These are just six examples over the last uh, five years that uh, all the cases won by the opposition for just against Ususan. But they continue to do that. I guess they must have a lot of money for that. Uh, this is the one, okay? What more do the Chinese want? Okay, basically because... Uh, yeah, because the idea that... You know, uh, 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 I'm knowing Barisan National has given everything, everything to the Chinese. And this is the former chief minister of uh, Malacca, Ali Rustam, saying that they, i.e. the Chinese, are very racist because they refuse to vote for Barisan National. So you have this kind of news. The thing is that, write or reply, forget it. Okay? And I'm not saying that just for the Malay media, even for NST, even for the stars, and then so difficult. Okay? The idea is that you write something, you accuse uh, you know, somebody of something, okay, and then when you want to, to do write a reply, uh, not interested, but they can call you to ask you to respond to that kind of thing. Sometimes we call it a lie, and then still manipulated after that. So you get trapped, you know? You either you, you say it or you don't say it, you always get trapped there. So that is the, the situation when I think you racialize the coverage of the media. Maybe it's, 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 it's less or rather uh, on the, 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 the uh, English media side 
Although NST try to play the Malay agenda a bit, but it's heavy on on the Malay media, but not so much on Sina Harian because Sina Harian is just a new kid in town. It's just basically he said, she said, that's it. They just produce like that, okay? And they even allow us to to advertise in their papers. Uh, uh, political advertisement never accepted in the Malay mainstream Malay media. Uh, but Amno Barisansha has a daily advertisement there. I don't know how they pay for that. I've, technically speaking, everybody basically uh, broke the rules of election commission because you're only supposed to spend, I think, I don't know, two or three hundred thousand ringgit for, for that campaign. But it seems that millions and tens of millions were spent. Uh, I think I better stop at that. Maybe later we can discuss about it. Thank you. Thank you, Wan Hamidi. Right. Um, we move on to the second speaker. Um, but bef before I give the word to to Jabba, I would like to say that he's he's going to well he's going to talk about the the new media as such I suppose and uh, I would just like to note that um, over the last ten fifteen years as um, a new awakening if you like in in Malaysian in the Malaysian public about politics a new interest in politics happened this was also exactly the the time that uh, technological innovation started coming so the two are. Uh, Interrelated, which comes first is, of course, I, I think the whole thing is rather symbiotic, really. Yeah. Okay. Jabba? Good morning. Um, Hamindi and I started in journalism together on the same day in the, news, in the same newspaper. Um, and since then, our paths has uh, crossed many times. Uh, he, he still remains in the, in the print world. Uh, I stopped being in the print world six and a half years after I started. Uh, I joined the Newswire, and then I did television, and I came back in Malaysia in, in um, 2010 from Jakarta, um, always observing what's happening in the Malaysian media. And, and we is right in saying there's a symbiotic relationship between uh, the so-called new media, which is technically 20 years old, so it's not that new, and, and online media in Malaysia. It all began in 1998 when um, Anwar Ibrahim got sacked. Um, you had a few blogs, um, you know, in internet. For example, I just just give you some statistics. In the year 2000, there were 3.7 million internet users in Malaysia for a population of 23 million people. That's it, 3,700, 3.7 million uh, internet users. Uh, it was the time of Jaring and TMNet. In 2012, we have a population of 29 million people. We have 17.2 million internet users. So that gives you an idea of how uh, internet usage has grown uh, in the country. We now have about uh, 14 million uh, face Facebook accounts in Malaysia, 14 million. Uh, in comparison, Singapore has only 2.9 million, right? Why are all these numbers important? I will get to it in a moment. Um, internet usage would suggest then that everybody then went, to the, went online to look for news. In 1998, a few blogs started supporting uh, Anwar Ibrahim. In 1999, two journalists by the name of Stephen Gunn and Premesh Chandran started Malaysia Kini. Uh, they were feature writers in a print newspaper called The Sun. Hamidi was also there. Um, and, but they left and, and they set up an online uh, portal called Malaysia Kini. You can say they're the granddaddy of Malaysian online media. Since then, it's been a gold rush. Um, Insider started in 2008. Uh, you now have uh, Free Malaysia Today, FZ, which she stands for Financial Zoo, uh, Malay Mail Online, Malaysian Digest, Malaysia Chronicles. There's about at least 10 of us in the business now. Uh, and we are there because the, the Malaysian mainstream media, as Hamidi pointed out, is controlled by ruling parties or businessmen aligned to ruling parties. And they have an agenda of keeping the status quo, which is well and fine in a democracy. Everyone has a right to express their views and their support. Uh, however, in the last 10, 15 years, you notice that uh, the, the language is a lot more shrill. Uh, it's becoming racialized. And, and on the reverse side, for the 
little op opposition that we have, uh, Malaysia Kini took the lead of taking the other corner. You know, one guy is a blue corner, they took the red corner, and they just covered news of, uh, of uh, just the opposition, more the opposition, because they had more access and all that. Um, fast forward that about from 1999 to 2006, 2008, uh, everyone realized you need more impartial news. You, you know, you, you have to go here to get this guy's news. You have to go here to get that, that first news. But no one's giving it all on one platform for free, which is where we stupidly got in, and, and we are losing money ever since. Uh, but you need to do this. Why? Uh, new media suggests that uh, with more people going online, and we're not just talking about the young, um, I'd be very surprised that when, when I got back to Malaysia that a lot of people who are retiring, whether from government or had left uh, or at the age of 55 decided to just stay at home, uh, they started buying little netbooks at a time. 2008 netbooks were up. Uh, now it's tablets, iPads, Android tablets and all that. They decided they want to go beyond the usual diet of uh, propaganda uh, by the government. Uh, and they started reading everything online. This is where the new media um, really shot off. Uh, easy access to smartphones. I'm, I actually have some notes here and a PowerPoint presentation, which I'm too embarrassed to show you. But it's in the smartphone. Um, tablet sales are up. Uh, in, just for example, uh, let me give you an example of the internet penetration in Malaysia. Um, some statistics, if I can find it. Uh, we now have in, in uh, some research shown that uh, mobile in penetration in Malaysia is now at 143%. Now what does that mean? Country of 29 million people, we have 37 million handphone accounts. 37 million. That's what 143% penetration is, of which about 20-25% are smartphones, 7 million. Now with all that, Malaysians and re residents having the smartphones and reading news, we, we are having them sharing all kinds of news, whether it's from the New Straits Times, from Utusan, from Rocket Kini, from Insider, from Malaysia Kini, sharing it, putting a spin to the news, reinterpreting it, Basically, they're taking our content, and this is the subject of what I'm speaking about. They're taking our content and using it as their discontent with, about the country. Right? They, they are taking all the signal and making it into noise. So new media, one lesson you've learned from new media is there's a lot of noise. You don't even know what the facts are anymore. People take one bit of fact, they twist it around like a Rubik's Cube, and you get something else. Right? A lot of noise, right? And, and why? Because it's new media, it's young. The time when I was in a newspaper, my editors were, were, came from an era of typewriters. They had the whole day to refine the news and bring it out the next day. 24 hours. They could cut through all the bullshit and put it out 24 hours later. These days, my mantra is, I want everything yesterday. Something happens, I want it up in five minutes. <coughs> so where are the people that experience to say, okay, this is not news, this is defamatory. Uh, I've got a, an old friend here in the audience. His name is Yang Razali. I remember him. We were, he was in Singapore Business Times and ST. I was in Malaysia Business Times. So I used to come down for Shipping Times events. We used to catch up. You have time to do that and, and actually discuss items before it goes up. These days, no. So you get a lot of noise going up, right? Uh, and, and all the guys, my colleagues, are very young. They have, this is very important in, in media, they have no context and perspective. It's just this whole block of news. We serve it to you. You do whatever you want with it. And you just spin it out here and there. It's great. Many voices, but there's no curation. Right? No one is curating this and saying, okay, this is important, this is not important. Right? Uh, the lesson of Malaysia is this, that, that we have a free-for-all, very cowboy, um, and everyone feels empowered because they are keyboard warriors. They put an anonymous name. Um, I'll give you an example. Yesterday, Ezra, Hamid, and I had, had dinner, and then we went to the ice school 
I school beer bar in, in uh, Emerald Link, and uh, they asked us to fill up a form, and I, I put the name of a popular Malaysian politician instead of my own name, because I can be anonymous, keyboard warrior. I can do anything I want. Nobody will trace it back to me. Um, and we're having a lot of that. And these people are the ones now, I think, dominating our discourse, all this noise that we can't even, in Malaysia, we don't even know what the real stories are anymore. We, the, the government of Malaysia, the politicians on both sides of the aisle, just listen to all this noise and decide that this is news. This is what this country should be working on. In the last eight weeks, I can, there's so many examples. Uh, uh, you know, a couple who are famous in Singapore put up a greeting, uh, an eat greeting, uh, eating bakute, um, and that became big news. They were charged for sedition. Um, you have this Muslim dog trainer washing, uh, bathing her dog, the sounds of a, a raya song and a prayer, call to prayer, and that became news. Um, a prayer room being, being used by a Buddhist group for meditation, that became news. We, we anguish over whether we should destroy this prayer room because it's, it's 10 degrees off uh, the Kaaba, and that, becomes, that dominates your headlines. But what, what was news in the last eight weeks was Fitch downgraded Malaysia's outlook to negative. It's on a negative watch because we are not reforming our, our, our financial situation. Uh, we have a huge deficit. Um, we are not introducing GST. And basically the country will run out of money before it gets any more money. But that's not news. Have you ever heard of that in Malaysia? No mainstream press writes about it. Um, online media, we wrote about it once, twice. Nobody wants to comment about it. Uh, nobody wants to roll off statistics like uh, household debt is 83%. Corporate debt is 95%. Uh, government's uh, fiscal deficit is 53.4%. But if we include uh, government letters of guarantees for various projects, it's 69%. I was just talking to Mr. Ui last night about this. Everyone talks in terms of percentages. But this year, we are a trillion dollar economy, trillion ringgit economy. Uh, and those numbers are staggering. Nobody talks about it. That, that signal is lost amidst all this noise about Malaysia and Muslim Malaysians who feel threatened that uh, non-Muslims want to use the word Allah to describe God, that non-Muslims want to take over their prayer spaces, uh, that uh, chauvinist Chinese want to, con want to take over Malaysia, a very rich country. Uh, all this is possible now because of new media. I love new media, but it's just given so much of space for all this noise that people forget the signal. What's this country all about? Where, where are we going with all this noise? And no one has the moral courage or the intellectual capacity and says, this is all bullshit. We should focus on this, this, and this. Um, no one's doing it. Uh, you have the Prime Minister still saying, uh, commenting on DAP's politics and, and repeating the lie that uh, 753 delegates were not informed uh, about the last uh, elections, uh, this and that, that uh, and that his team took about five to ten days later to, die, to deny uh, an Anwar interview that there were offers of a unity government. They, they're so consumed uh, of, of gazing at their navel and not beyond it, uh, sulking about election results, that they are talking about everything that's trivial uh, online. Because, because the gentlemen and ladies online uh, do not have the capacity to they're being led around by us saying this is news. So then they say this is news, then we believe it's news, and we're in this vicious cycle, this is news. It's not news. None of this is news. Uh, you know, I, do I lament about the days of newspapers? No, because the newspapers have been abused to an extent that they're nothing more than a street food wrapper. You know, uh, of course, in Singapore, you don't use it to wrap your street food anymore, but we still do, uh, because that's all it's, it's fit for. Uh, or to line our bird cages, our kitty litter. That's all it's good for. You know, it's very sad. 
But those of us who are online media, we, we, we have a problem. Our problem is simple. Do we want to stick to doing proper news, uh, which, which is about news that matters, or do we want to get the eyeballs to get the advertisers to keep us uh, sustaining as a business organization? I was talking to Professor James Chin, and he says, you know, uh, are you making at least 50% to cover your operational expenses? 50 to 70, I say, no, you can't even make 40%. Uh, so you still, uh, we, we are one country, and I don't know whether it, uh, it applies to Singapore, uh, it applies to Indonesia and Thailand, we are one country where uh, people in the Western Hemisphere pay us to provide news to our fellow countrymen. That's, that's, that's quite sad, you know, because we are not interested in news. Uh, we, are not in, we are interested in, uh, a fair number of interested in news, that's 30,000 people. Because what has happened in new media is this. Uh, it used to be relevance by location. If you're in Malaysia, you're in Singapore, you're interested in what's happening in Malaysia or Singapore. So you pick up the Singapore Straits Times, you pick up the New Straits Times, and read about this accident or, you know, like in Singapore, five people caught peeing in the lift again. Um, but you're online, you're global, uh, you are, your relevance is by passion. Uh, you're interested in saving the turtles, so you join a forum about turtles. You're interested in photography. Or you're interested in, in, in uh, rock bands of the 60s or, or punk rock bands, like how many is. Uh, so you join those forums, right? So your relevance is by passion. And so you exclude every other chapter, and you're just interested in this, not realizing that you are in a starship called Malaysia or Singapore, uh, and, and this is the one that, that makes, gives you a living of sorts. You make your living here, and, and you've got to be worried about your country. We are not, because we are so global, because we are so connected and net, as Professor James Jin says. Malaysia, uh, Singapore is the only country where I don't really have to walk out of my flat to do my work. Everything is done online, right? So, so when you're on completely online in a virtual world, that all that chatter is your world, right? And, and, and the politicians in Malaysia believe that this is, this is what we have to address, uh, housing problems, uh, uh, religious problems, taking the eye off the ball that uh, in the 21st century, um, everyone's interested in Burma, uh, Indochina, they're all coming up. You know, I, I read uh, Mr. Lee's and Lung's speech about, about you know, the, the way forward. Uh, we don't have a way forward in Malaysia except who's going to buy the new tablet and this is that, and how we just keep sharing news. Uh, that are the lessons that we are learning now in Malaysia, that, that we are so obsessed with this, we don't know what's real anymore. Thank you very much. Thank you, Java. <coughs> yeah. Right, um, we come to our third speaker, Ezra Said. Um, now, what I find interesting about Ezra is that, uh, as uh, Wan Hamidi uh, started out by saying, um, the issue of sensitivities is, is used all the time in Malaysia. Everybody is sensitive about something or other. And in an, an atmosphere like that, I think humor is, is quite a weapon. And that is what Ezra, I think, is quite known for. He, uh, he makes political commentary that in, in a humorous way. Well, Malaysians are humorous people, but uh, you wouldn't guess that by looking at their politics. Uh, but I think Ezra is trying to change that in his own way. Ezra, words yours. Thank you, Dr. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, this is very, very strange for me to be on a panel with uh, Hamidi, who you know I've worked with, I've read his work, and Jahaba, who you know when Malaysian Insider came out, I was as, as excited as the next Malaysian about reading news that wasn't coming from the mainstream media. Um, I don't have a career that is as comprehensive as and distinguished as theirs. Uh, all I can share with you today is uh, the few experiences uh, that I've had in the many fields that I work in, uh, in these, <laughs> well, this is quite embarrassing, I've, I've only been working for the past five, six years. And um, so what I'm going to share this morning is about, uh, in terms of discourse and ideas, um, and basically the different mediums in which I work in, primarily online through uh, a satirical political online show called That Effing Show. Um, and we'll get to my work on radio with BFM Radio, the business station, where I am part of the evening edition, which is the drive time 
well, rather the peak time from 5 o'clock to 8 o'clock, and where we talk about local and international stories. And then I'll move on to what, what, what I started um, upon graduation was to be involved in publishing, which was all nice and all until I got arrested, and then it wasn't so great. So um, I was basically, you know, Jahaba hit the nail right on the head. Um, in Malaysia, and Hamidi and Jahaba are so much involved in, in terms of news and content, uh, there's just an unbelievable amount of noise. Um, and it's, for a lot of Malaysians, um, you know, there is this impression that everybody, everything's so political and everything's politicized. There are a significant amount of Malaysians, especially uh, I would say my generation and potentially younger, they don't really give a crap about politics, especially the, the, the genre and type of politics that is being practiced in Malaysia. Um, this younger generation is, is, um, doesn't know who Enid Blyton is, but know who they, they know who Steve Jobs is. They know um, they don't know necessarily, or they don't familiarize themselves with what a paperback is, but they know what an iPad magazine is. And so for many of them, the way they uh, consume content, and they can quickly see and analyze what is hypocritical, or what is disingenuous, or what is um, sort of fake. Um, and it, I, I guess the, the younger audience seems to be able to digest a lot of this information a lot quicker. So in, in looking at a lot of the mainstream media content, especially in the old media of print newspapers and, and you know, the wonderful news programming that we have on RTM1 and RTM2 and TV3 and TV7, there, there is a complete disengagement. And so immediately they run to websites like Malaysian Insider, Malaysia Kini. Um, and uh, as a result, um, everything, all this content that you see is not really news, it's very funny content. Um, and that's where I guess I came in um, with this show called That Effing Show. And what That Effing Show is, it's a three to seven minute program where I talk into the camera and another three or four members come in and we act out um, certain prejudices and, and in, in humorous ways and, and basically a commentary on, on the ridiculous world that we live in. Um, and sometimes, and in the past three years, um, it, what's gotten more and more difficult is that the humor in which my fellow writers and I try to produce is not nearly as funny as the real life situations happening in Malaysia. So the punchlines that we are trying to create can't actually compete with the factual headlines that are taking place. Now, as a comedic writer, this is very frustrating because, you know, we, we like to, you know, satire is, is interesting because the, it, it, it sits on a very fine line between being subversive and um, being something that is reflective towards a mirror. Uh, something that you sort of, you look at yourself and say, well, you know, maybe that's, something that I should take into account of. And that's what That Effing Show does. And That Effing Show uh, has been around since 2010. And in 2010, um, broadband penetration wasn't very, very big. But we were cognizant of the fact that in the region, broadband penetration was increasing. And we started off you know, with a few shows which were horrible, not very funny at all. Um, but as we moved on, um, you know, over a span of two or three days, we would get 3,000 views. And you know, as the show went on, uh, we would get 10,000 views, 15,000 views, 40,000 views, on the way all, all about 150,000 views. Now, what happened, therefore, was then it became less, it, it was so simple to make these shows. It would basically be taking a headline and turning it on its head and putting it against other situations which have occurred in the past that show a great deal of inconsistency and then people would laugh. And what happens is, is that because of this, because of this noise and, and, and frustration that Malaysians, Malaysians see, after, they're so, after they've been so frustrated by reading the Malaysian Insider or what news, they, 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 ho they hopefully come to watch that effing show and have a laugh about it. And, but it's really, really difficult to, to distinguish why exactly we're laughing because these situations are real. Um, and what's been interesting about as to why uh, the show has resonated three years on or is still relevant um, still reflects on the same concerns and um, restrictions that many of us within those who work in the media we work under. Um, Hamidi mentioned the Printing and Presses Publications Act. Um, 
Johaba, I'm sure, gets plenty of visits by uh, the MCMC, the regulators who uh, oversee online content, and I, I am no different. Um, every now, at least, uh, every script or every preview of each episode, I send a little low-res video of it to my lawyer just to make sure that everything's okay. And, it, and it, it's very dangerous because, as I understand, humor is not very easy to pull off here in Singapore. Apparently, you can't wear T-shirts and kangaroos. So um, I think you guys have more problem than we do. I mean, you see, we're going through a hard time, but we can laugh about it. Um, and... Uh, and in fact, Singapore has its own version of what is happening in Malaysia. Shows like that I think show. Uh, I think uh, you have the Mr. Brown show um, here in Singapore. And it's similar things. And th this generation in which is looking at new and exciting content, to it, because what people are looking to, to the show for is just common sense and having a laugh. But if you can't, and, and that's my concern, if people are coming to my stupid little show for common sense, then we have a problem. Because I write the show with these other bunch of idiots, and we make jokes. But the fact that that resonates with a significant amount of the, the, the watching public, I think we have a real problem. Because it means that there is a vacuum with regards to the leadership, with regards to the thought leadership. There's a vacuum in terms of discussing policy. There's a vacuum in in, um, in the media to point out these inconsistencies. So I if, if we are looking at a satirical online show to point these things out in an engaging and fun manner, it's great, it's infotainment. But then you know, we have to ask ourselves, what are the other mediums doing? And so right now on Pop TV, uh, wh which is the network in which hosts that effing show, I find myself now starting to produce other different shows that serve different purposes because I would still like that effing show to be a comedy show rather than a show that um, is constantly about political satire because the moment you take yourself too seriously and the moment that comedy is not your number one objective and you start preaching to people about what you think, then I become like this guy, like a news organization, and I don't want to be that. And it's something that we've been desperately trying to retain, but it's getting harder and harder as... Uh, the news becomes more and more ridiculous. Um, moving on from that, uh, in terms of this discussion about signal and, and noises, um, it was from that effing show that um, Mali Ali, who is the managing director of BFM, the business station, he's sitting here in the audience, um, it was from my appearances on that effing show that brought me to uh, a career now at, at BFM radio station on the evening edition. And it is quite interesting to be working in this radio station called BFM. It only airs in the Klang Valley, but you can log on to bfm.my and, and, and listen to it live and download podcasts. And the, and the content happening on the business radio station is quite fascinating. So as people in Klang Valley and Malaysia are becoming familiar with this radio station, there's a very simple conception. Oh, Ezra, you know, you don't know much about business. Why are you on a, on a business radio station? And I say, that's right. Business, you know, there's stocks and there's market exchanges and there's all of that in the morning. But there's also this other thing that we spend a lot of our time doing is going through the business of life. So on matters of education, on matters of healthcare, on matters of public policy and, and social causes, um, BFM now covers both of those areas, both of, both of those spheres, um, equally over, uh, over throughout the day. And in the evening, I essentially continue my commentary or my, my take on how ridiculous things are. Rather than facing to a camera that will be published onto YouTube, I'm saying it through a microphone that will go into people's cars for about three hours. And now what's really, really interesting about that is BFM is... It's, I mean, this is, not, this is not new media. This is old. I mean, this is real old. Um, but what's really interesting about what's happening now is that discourse and debate and discussion, something that has been absent in Malaysia in any medium for the better part of 20, 25 years, has suddenly emerged through this particular radio station. And I wasn't there at the beginning uh, of when BFM started, but it started off with in the morning where basically business leaders and finance leaders were questioned about 
you know, their decisions. They were grilled. We have a segment called the Breakfast Grill, and all of these guys were being grilled about their business decisions and what they do and whether that's ethical and whether, um, you know, everything is transparent. From all that questioning and debate that arose in the business area, we then translated that into the evening when we were talking and we would start questioning things about social issues, things about legislation, things about policy. And somewhere along the way, we managed to sneak that by with the regulators, but then suddenly the regulators woke up one day and said, hey, 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 I think they're talking about something else other than business. And as a result, in the evening now, um, it's become the mainstay of where at least discourse that happens in the public sphere that people can participate. And I don't think, I mean, Jabba, I mean, if you think of any other circumstance in which members of the public can hear each other, can talk to each other, and can engage with each other, this is the first time that that's happened on any scale since, you know, back in the day in Radio 4, you know, when people would call in and stuff. It hasn't happened in a long time. And so, so this is what happens when you, when, when you sort of merge some of the concerns that Jahaba was making in terms of the anonymity of people um, writing in and, and, and making police reports and stuff like that. When you're calling in to make a point and to articulate point A to point B with an argument, this is all very, very new for many, many Malaysians. Whether you're urban, whether you're rural, whether whatever uh, segment of society you come from, the idea of speaking with a point and arguing it in public is something very new that's taking place, but it's happening and it's thriving and it's th terrific. But at the same point, it's something that the regulators aren't very comfortable with. And they're not comfortable for many reasons. A, I would assume that, as I mentioned, it hasn't happened in a long time. B, there's a lot of pressure. I mean, every, I mean living in KL is just terrific. It's just a pressure cooker of of insanity and, and wanting to do something meaningful while making sure that you can put food on your plate. But what's happening at BFM right now is that all of this discourse that's happening on every level is, is selling. And now we have competitive radio stations who used to play format radio, format radio being I will talk for two minutes about something nonsensical, about the weather, about lifestyle, about beauty, about uh, uh, something about sports, play a song and move on. But BFM has now extended it to three, four, five minutes discussions, you know, cutting intermittently to songs. Other radio stations are now scratching their heads like, wait, now people don't want to hear only music, people want to hear talk radio. And suddenly, talk radio in 2013 is becoming the in thing. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. But credit to uh, Malay and <laughs> that, it, that, that it's working and discourse sells. And so this discourse that's happening on, on air and, and online, um, I failed to mention that in the three years of doing that effing show with my collective, we weren't being paid to do it. We were just doing it out of fun. But what's translated is in the past six months, eight months, Companies, brands, organizations from the Samsungs to the Nokias to the BMWs to um, uh, Nissans have come and approached my collective to produce content, creative content for them. So what they'll say is, so Ezra, we, we like this satirical uh, funny mode that you're doing, but we don't want it to have all the elements that are in that effing show. Because you know, in that effing show we talk on politics, sex, religion, culture, race, policy. Let's have it funny, but none of that. So now humor is becoming something that you can sell, which is terrific. I mean, I, it was something that I was just doing on the weekends just to have a little bit of fun, but now I can actually make money of it. But now there's money in discourse, there's money in humor, and um, there's a great, um, I guess, value in, in trying to make um, both of those coexist without getting arrested. And, and this will bring me to my third and final uh, venture, when I came back to Malaysia, um, having graduated with an arts degree, uh, I, I, I ventured into publishing. And in venturing into publishing, the vacuum that I saw was two things. I saw um, a lack of translated Malay content. Um, so what you have in other countries uh, in the region around the world, where trans the translation market is a huge market. So. Harry Potter does well around the world, not because everybody's reading in English, everybody's reading in their native tongues. 
but you would be hard pressed to find Harry Potter translated into Bahasa Malaysia or Malay. And the reason behind that is because, uh, well, it, it's tenfold. Uh, there's a dearth of translators. Um, the, the, the market, the Malay language reading market is cornered by religious books, love books, cooking books, and how to pray books. And if you want to make money in publishing, apart from going into education and, and, and that sort, that's a great market to, ha to be in. But I went into the market wanting to uh, provide a space for creative fiction and creative nonfiction, and essentially translate works that people were reading around the world that were translated in 50, 60, 70 languages, but for some reason it wasn't translated into Malay. And so somewhere around the 70s, we stopped. Well, Dewan Bahas and Pustaka, the protectors of our national language, stopped translating. We used to translate Shakespeare. We used to translate um, George Bernard Shaw. I mean, you know, it was great stuff. And then we stopped translating. We stopped translating because we didn't want ideas to reach the Malay language or the Malay readership and that populace. So I started translating. I started contacting my favorite authors. And you start contacting Reza Aslan, who wrote No God But God with Random House. You start contacting um, publishers in Penguin, HarperCollins. You start contacting all these international publishers. And you suddenly quite quickly discover it's so easy to get the Malay language right. And they go, oh, we're so excited that you, you want to translate because nobody has contacted us. It's so amazing that my fellow publisher in Malaysia, Amir Mohammed, who runs a very successful publishing outfit, he's just translated uh, Stephen King's new book, Joyland. And it was the same response. We've never had a Malay translation. And so I felt that this move was justified. Whether it was going to make financial uh, or commercial sense was another matter. But so came along one day, well, one day, I say about a year ago. I'm about four years into my publishing business. I've translated, I've published many, many books. I've published 20, 25 titles. I've translated another 10, um, some to different degrees of success. But I do have a special space in terms of translating or working or publishing with materials that contain ideas on Islam, on the history of Islam, on uh, on politics and social politics, that essentially what my publishing house, Zarai Publications, became known for. If you wanted, you know, political books and books on translation or translated books, Zarai Publications was 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 the, was the publishing house. And basically, about two years ago, two and a half, three years ago, I read this book. Well, I was a student. It was called "The Trouble with Islam Today." The author of that book was Irshad Manji. And she was, well, that particular book, that particular title did, did very, very well. It did very well in North America, in Europe, and it got translated in many languages. And upon contacting her and her agents to translate it, I, was about, I got the documents to sign the contract. And it was a Sunday afternoon, and I noticed that in the newspaper there was a list of books being banned, the latest, rather, list of books being banned. And the book that I was about to sign the language rights for was on that list. So I called up Rishad and said, you know, it's not going to be a go. I don't want to lose money, at least not this way. Uh, we'll try again next time. A couple of years later, she comes up with a new book called Allah, Liberty, and Love. Um, and it's basically an extension to that book about the discourse that's happening within young Muslims, discussing many things like um, uh, reconciling faith and issues of freedom. And I thought, well, you know, this book, would really add to the discourse of what's happening in Malaysia because you know we we're not having that discourse, and of course I translated that book, like I've translated many many other books, fiction and non-fiction, and upon translating that, what you want to do is you want to prepare for a book tour. You want your author to come into the country, whether they're local or foreign, and promote the book. What happened thereafter, after it's being published and the book is in bookstores, is something that my mom and dad aren't very pleased about in that one morning uh, you know I get a call from the office saying that the state religious authorities are at your office and I was surprised but not surprised because only a few days before that a bookseller at Borders a Muslim a bookseller she was the highest ranking senior bookstore manager at the time she was arrested for selling the book. And there were already murmurs of the book wanting to be banned. But at this point in time, it wasn't banned. So she's been arrested under state religious enactments. Enactment. 
and there I am on, 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 on Tuesday morning, and I'm arrested as well. And it's a very strange phenomenon because it's not exactly like cops on, you know, when you, you know, you've got the police and everything. They're, they're very, and they don't come in with skull caps and, and jubas. They, they come in, they, I, I don't know which batch I got, but they look very smart and slick. And they were reading me my rights and the things that I purportedly uh, had been uh, co committing offense against. And the three things I was um, guilty of was I was guilty of publishing materials that are contrary to the precepts of Islam. And the second thing was I was guilty of distributing and I was guilty of possession. And so all of these, and these guys um, are doing so in full view that the book hasn't been banned yet or no announcement or nothing has been gazetted yet. So I'm arrested, I'm brought to the police station, and I'm brought to their offices, um, which is also where the Sharia courts are. And it's a very, very strange phenomenon because you're not exactly arrested in the traditional sense where you know, you're know you aware that you're arrested, but you can't, I can't exactly leave either because I was almost trying to say, guys, if you want to arrest me, charge me now so I can get back to the radio station because Malay is not going to be happy that I'm not at the radio station. So. You know, I, I really would like to get on with my day. What was really fascinating was, I even though I was arrested in the morning, they would delay everything right up to about 4 o'clock in the afternoon to charge me. So I would go into the judge's chambers, and he would read me what has happened. It's 4 o'clock. I think it's, no, is this a Friday or Thursday or Friday? It's 4 o'clock. And what they do is, in, in, in all the harassment techniques that they do, is that the judge tells me, you either get uh, a civil servant to act as your surety um, to ensure that you won't leave the country or whatever, or you pay bail. I'm like, perfect, I'll pay bail. I've called my brother, Abang, get all the money you can, let's pay bail. So we're ready, it's 4.10, the judge lets me leave at 4.10. So I've got the cash in hand, I'm ready to pay bail. I say, no, you can't, you can't pay cash. I say, what do you mean? I say, well, they say, you have to open a bank account put your money in, we'll freeze it, get the bank to show a bank statement, and then come back to our, to our counters and we'll approve that your bail has been properly done. But of course, it's at 4.10, and on Friday, banks close at 4.30. <laughs> so at which point in time, their counters close at 5.15. So you begin this crazy, ridiculous scenario of my brother running to the bank and pleading with the bank officer and me sort of starting in the car and doesn't start. It, 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 this sequence of committing with my lawyer ha hasn't had a, a workout in quite a while. And so you, you the, the basically, you know, the idea was to delay everything so that, that I would have to stay in the lockup uh, for not being able to pay bail. And, you know, unfortunately, bank managers at CIMB were terrific and got everything done in half an hour and I managed to pay bail. And that was a, more than a year ago. And to this day, those charges of me, uh, the, I was charged in the Sharia court. I've basically been able to put that off and basically uh, go to the civil courts and say that these charges that are charged against me are unconstitutional. And so what's happening right now is that um, my lawyers, and, my lawyers and, and, the, and the team of lawyers were going to the federal court to ask the question as to whether these state enactments that I was charged with is contrary to the constitutional guarantee of freedom of speech. And so right now we are waiting uh, for a federal court hearing. It'll be quite exciting. And it's quite exciting simply because we would like to know whether constitutional guarantee, uh, fundamental liberties guaranteed in the, in the Constitution and will hold up against state religious enactments that are you know, passed uh, and created um, and without really being tested as to whether they're constitutional. This afternoon, as I'm with you right now, in about two hours from now, my lawyers will be heading to the Kuala Lumpur High Court to contest the, the ban of the book. And I only found out last Thursday that it was going to be this afternoon. And, and basically, um, this is going to be an ongoing uh, extension of what's happening in, in Malaysia about fundamental liberties, about discourse, about having the ability to, to say um, what you think without the concerns of being arrested without saying something insulting to Islam. Not everything is insulting to Islam. I mean, Islam has gotten far enough quite well, don't you think? I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable that in Malaysia right now, that a fatwa, 
an advisory legal opinion has, is able to turn into a piece of legislation with the full effect of law on only one particular community. And fatwas, being that they are governed by state uh, officials and authorities, you get different fatwas in every state. On that state, you can't smoke shisha. On that state, you can't do this. On that state, you can't do that. And it's fun and games. But it's affecting people's lives. It's not being very productive. It's, and we're keeping our eye off the ball on the main topics of discussion. And we have many, many problems in Malaysia from, from all the things that we've mentioned. And so uh, in all the things that um, I've been doing uh, to, I don't know what I'm doing, to be honest. I really don't. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I, I think we all, we're all just trying to sort of bring common sense back to the fold in Malaysia. But it's getting harder and harder. It's getting more challenging to do so. And um, it's probably with great hope that, um, I mean, you know, it, it, that some of it begins to trickle in with this new generation that is able to distinguish um, and be able to point out and identify some of the hypocrisies and some of these double standards and uh, many of the things that we've spoken about is about selective prosecution or persecution. And so um, those are the three areas in which I've been working in. And Hopefully, I'll be able to head back on a flight to Kuala Lumpur with some good news as to whether um, the book that was banned um, was actually a threat to public order. So we'll see. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Ezra. Um, well, we sometimes tend to think that information technology somehow um, is quite neutral and happens in, in rather neutral circumstances, but obviously not. Um, and uh, it, it's obvious to us, I think, that um, our guests are part of those people who are actually building the infrastructure for, for what the mass media and the printing industry will look like in the near, near future. I'll open the, f the, the, flo um, the floor to questions now. Um, yes, ma'am. Yes. Good morning. My name is Chong Wu Ling. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate from the Department of Sociology and U.S. I have questions for Mr. Wan Hamidi Hamid and Mr. Ezra Zaid. Uh, for Mr. Uh, Wan Hamidi Hamid, uh, my first question is, uh, how popular is Rocket Kini among Malays in Malaysia nowadays? And my second question, um, have you ever encounter any challenges from the Malay community for being involved in the AP's publications and website. And for Mr. Ezra Sai, uh, I would like to uh, ask, uh, just now you say that there's a lack of uh, Malay translations of uh, well-known works um, such as uh, works uh, like Harry Potter's and uh, Shakespeare's works in Malaysia. but. What about Indonesian translation? As far as I know, in Indonesia, uh, they have uh, Indonesian translation for all these books. So are they available in Malaysia? And are they, if, if they are, are they popular among the Malay readers? Thank you. Um, any other question immediately following that? Sir? I think I'll take three, three uh, questions at a time. Okay, good morning. I'm uh, Jude. I'm a lecturer at uh, ERC Institute. Okay, I have two questions, right? Number one is, uh, <clears throat> as uh, Mr. Java has mentioned earlier, uh, Malaysia now has currently 17.2 million who are wired. Uh, I don't know whether that includes the 1 million people, uh, Malaysians that are out of Malaysia, right? Uh, how much, what are the effects of this social media on the landscape of uh, political change in the current situation? If you looked at the run-up to the GE13, you will know that uh, Tato Ambiga uh, and her Bursay movement uh, capitalized on social media. The DAP uh, also capitalized on social media during the ROS uh, deregistration uh, topic. Uh, PKR, Rafizi Ramli, uh, with his uh, Blackout 505 movement, they also capitalized on social media. But unfortunately, Swaram, 
Transparency International Malaysia and PASS did not actually capitalize on social media, right? So uh, in the long run, looking at the current situation in Malaysia, do political uh, analysts see a people's power in Malaysia, the same one that was used to overthrow the Marcos government in Philippines many years ago, right? Question number two, are we still in race-based politics? If you look at Singapore and Malaysia, we will know that it is not, I mean, it, it is impossible to think that there will be a non-Chinese Prime Minister in Singapore. At the same time, it is also unimaginable to think of a non-Muslim Prime Minister in Malaysia. But the difference is, the many political parties in Singapore are not race-based politics, except for one, which is AMNO Singapore. But if you look at Malaysia, you will find that most of the parties, or all the parties, are race-based politics. DAP actually ran foul of the CEC uh, elections simply because they wanted to put a Malay, a Muslim CEC member in their team, right? So uh, not so sure whether race-based politics actually work. Because if you look at uh, even uh, Pakatan uh, before the GE13, they were not able to even showcase a shadow cabinet to tell the people, all right, who's going to be the prime minister or who's going to be the deputy prime minister. Because there is a lot of talks that Anwar will be the prime minister or Pas Hadi Awang will be the prime minister. So on and so forth. People were not sure and no one was willing to commit. So are we, is race-based politicians still relevant in the new Malaysia. Thank you. Could you, could you introduce yourself, sir? Yeah, my name is Jude. Actually, I'm a Malaysian working in Singapore. I've been here for the last uh, 30 years, right? Okay. And I've been following uh, Malaysian politics for right. that many years. Okay, thank you. Um, sir, you had your hand up. We'll have to wait for the next round. Working. Uh, I says for arranging this extremely interesting lecture, and also for the presentation of the speakers in quite outstanding, in my opinion, and worthy of their reputation. My question arises from the recent spate of what is known, what is sold as anti-Islamic behavior. And the latest one after the Surah event was this campaign against the Shias. What is behind all this nonsense? Uh, because, <laughs> because Malaysia is one of the signatories to the Amman Accord in 2004, 5, and 6, uh, s uh, saying that all these s sections of Islam are legal sections and recognized by the countries and the ulemas of those countries. Uh, the signatory for Malaysia was the Prime Minister Badawi, the Deputy Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim, and one of the religious leaders. Now, I'd really like to know well, what is happening behind, behind this, and what do you think is going to happen in the future? Are you, are you going to get back into the, what's happening in the Middle East of Muslims killing Muslims for, for reasons unknown and not rational? Thank so you. this interests me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, shall we, we take these three questions in one go? Will we start with you, Anamidi? 
Um, question one. Is rocket kidney popular among the Malays? No. <laughs> uh, okay, but, okay, uh, started uh, in 2009 or 2010. Uh, we, we in DAP consider it a success simply because we have never tried uh, to engage the Malays through uh, 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 that, that kind of format and also to engage the Malays seriously. Uh, not to say that the AP is a Chinese party, but you must understand the context of history. Post-69, Gerakan, PPP, PAS, join with the alliance to form Parisan National. So the only opposition parties left then were DAP and Parti Rakyat Malaya. Okay? The Malays were prone to, to Parti Rakyat, the Chinese and Indians to DAP. When you have the NEP, so you know they, they were bound to have problems after that. So who will take care of the problems of the non-Malays? So DAP took that role. And it went on the next 20 years. So because the Malays believe that you know, if, 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 if you don't like UMNO, you have passed. And you have other Malay parties along the way, either Semangat the now defunct Semangat Pak Punam, and then later Parti Keadilan Nasional, and that which became Parti Keadilan Rakyat. Okay, so the tendency of the question is still race based in that sense. So therefore, when DAP 2006 have decided let's revamp our party a bit, you know, change um, the ideology from democratic socialism to social democracy, which to some party members for them no big deal. Once I was still a journalist, then I asked one, one not so senior but senior DAP uh, MP, asked him, So, what do you think the change from democratic socialism to uh, social democracy? He said, Aya sama saja lah, you know, uh, it's the same. Okay, so it doesn't matter. So, it's not really an ideological party in a sense, but party that protects uh, the unprotected uh, or whatever uh, that time. Okay, so. When you have uh, Rocket Kini, the website in Bahasa, and you continue to, to, to print uh, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, BM Bahasa version of that, uh, the idea that we were thinking at the time is it's not to ask the Malays to join the AP, to, to, to convince them of anything, it's just to let the Malays, especially, although the idea is not for the Malays, but whoever reads Bahasa, of course, the Malays are the majority. The idea is that so that the Malays would know what DAP is, what DAP is fighting for, what, what is its ideology, so that when you know what DAP is, even if you reject DAP, after knowing DAP, then it's okay. Rather than you are rejecting DAP because you think it's a Chinese chauvinist party, it's a communist party, it's a party that wants to establish a Christian state, which is ridiculous. Uh, so that's the idea. The, that we consider a success simply because we want to engage with the Malays. Okay? In terms of popular, popular, popularity, uh, again, I don't have Facebook. I don't know how it works, actually, but um, we have like 60,000 likes. I think it's okay for a political party, I guess. Uh, yeah, that's it. The second question, uh, what the problems I face with being with the AP, is it? Okay, something that I just want to share a story about two years ago, a reunion of my classmates in Penang, uh, all Malays, uh, this uh, what uh, the, the, the Malay, uh, the Muslim Association uh, group or something. We went there. They knew that I was with DAP. We haven't met for a very very long time. Everybody was trying very hard to be nice to me. You know, <laughs> perhaps I, I don't know why. And until one guy, a, a classmate, eh, a real classmate, came to me and asked me. Uh, well, you are with the AP, you know. Uh, now, you know the, the the chief minister of Penang is from the AP. Uh, can you guarantee that Penang will not become like Singapore? So I asked him, oh, "What do you mean? What's happening in Singapore? You know, you know the Malays being oppressed there." I said, "Are you sure? Uh, have you been there? Uh, no. Then how do you know? Well, the newspaper says so." Okay, so that's that's the problem that we face. So okay, I said never mind, never mind. Let's let's forget about that fact. But I am staying in KL. You are staying in Penang. Why are you asking me about this? Don't you know the reality? 
And then the same thing he said, yeah, yeah, I know, I, I face no problem, but you know, they are talking about it. So this is again that we are talking about the power of the media, the belief, the kind of hegemony that, that you are you're in. So, yeah, no, no normalists attack me directly, whatever kind of thing. Uh, but being in DAP, being Malay, I think I personally, personally think that uh, less freedom of me to say things. Because you, know, you may end up hurting your, your friend, your friendlies, your, your partners. Like, you know, I can't simply say, oh, we are uh, DAP, we fight for a secular uh, democracy, that kind of thing. Because past may not be happy with it, although they know reality. Because past also know that DAP may not be happy if you're talking about Islamic State. Okay, that's why I personally have proposed to, to all these Pakatan people, look, now post-election, sit down, have a closed door meeting, trash out things, rather than you wait another four or five years, and then in election, you know that you'll be manipulated by the media. You know, it's simple, the trick is simple. Okay, if you remember, you read the star, uh, when during the campaign, you know, uh, okay, uh, don't vote for DAP because DAP will always support paths to form Islamic State. You know, uh, it's the same thing like, like what, they, they, what they do in Penang. Okay, the Malay, the Malay groups, Amno, Perkasa, the ultra Malay group, will always say that uh, the Chinese are oppressing, I mean, the Chinese as in DAP oppressing the Malays. MCA will be saying that the, 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 the chief minister is helping uh, the Malays too much that he's neglecting the Chinese. So it is a race uh, based politics still. It's, it's difficult to get, get out of, of that. Uh, but if it's the case of saying that you know DAP CEC, okay, trying to put a token Malay there, that kind of thing, uh, that's the decision of the delegates. I, I think unfair for me to, to comment on that. But the, uh, the reality is that majority members of the DAP are still Chinese. Okay, so we are in the process of opening up, but uh, well, it may take uh, the time is needed for that because in our retreat we did talk about that. Uh, we don't want uh, uh, the Malays joining the AP thinking that, you know, uh, uh, oh, we can turn it into an AMNO or past style. We also don't want Chinese to join the AP thinking this is MCA 2.0 or Indians to join uh, uh, the AP thinking uh, this is MIC 2.0. But the reality outside there, people still talk about their race. So the question is, do we engage, educate, discuss, debate, or do we play along? Do we go for the lowest common denominator? So, but the thing is that once you do open debate, you have all the media against you. That is a, a challenge. Shia Sunni, Jaba, help me here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Jaba, help him. <laughs> okay, um, I think I'll, I'll address uh, Mr. Jude's questions about social media. Um, the internet. Can you go as far as the internet connections are in Malaysia? Uh, 17.2 million uh, accounts in Malaysia. Um, 7 million smartphones. So that's all within Malaysia. Uh, the internet penetration in Malaysia, first quarter 2013, is 66.6%. .6%, the devil's number. In end of 2012, it was 66%. So, um, and all these are urbanized areas. Uh, very urban, semi-urban areas. All these guys, because of the gerrymandering in, in, in the Malaysian uh, uh, electoral system, means they, uh, it takes three people to vote for an opposition guy to enter parliament, uh, rather than one guy to vote for Barisan National to enter parliament. That's how it's stacked. So you can have connectivity everywhere. As long as we are stuck with 222 seats, uh, we will have the same results. It won't change. Uh, you, you can see where Berse is popular. You can see where uh, a few of these NGOs are very popular. Um, but you can also see where they are not popular in, in rural areas like uh, Sarawak and Sabah for the simple reason um, our countrymen in Sabah and Sarawak do not face the issues we face in Peninsula Malaysia. And neither do we face their issues. In their 50th year as a nation, I will give you one example before uh, election 2013 that tells you how, how different uh, their experience is as a Malaysian as ours is. Uh, a, a bunch of uh, DAP politicians, uh, Pakatarai politicians went over uh, to give charamas, you know, uh, talks. 
and they were lamenting about how cruel the police were uh, during the Bursay rallies. You know, uh, eight point uh, demands for free and fair elections, uh, the whole works, you know, uh, uh, postal voting. Uh, indelible ink and all that. And I said, you know, we were beaten, we were water cannon, everything was done to us, all the extremes that you can think of. Um, and so one question was asked in Sabah, a guy asked, what's a water cannon? <laughs> there are no water cannons in Sabah. If there was a riot or rally in Sabah, they, they get the fire brigade to come and, and, and hose them down. So, you know, it, then it struck the peninsula politicians we are in trouble here because we're talking about human rights, fundamental liberties, which uh, Ezra is going through. But the, 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 our countrymen in Sabah and Sarawak, their, their fundamental rights and liberties are trying to uh, earn a living um, in a city because uh, all the jungles are gone. You know? so, and, and so these guys have no access to, to handphones, to uh, internet. Uh, what the government of Malaysia has done, uh, surprisingly, is they've set up a fund. They have a fund. Uh, it's called the Universal Services Fund, uh, USP. Uh, all telcos have to contribute to it. And it's, worth, it's got $4 billion. They wasted a billion on laptops, uh, giving it to people. And, and, and these guys just go to... See, we are lucky in Malaysia. We can go to McDonald's and Starbucks and get free internet. Singapore doesn't have that. Uh, but what they do is then the government sets up this kampong Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi villages. So they, they're giving free internet everywhere. All these chaps get this, this free notebook, um, which is made in China, obviously, free netbook. Uh, and the first thing they do, instead of uh, listening to live.bfm.my uh, podcast or Nomination Insider or Nomination Kini, they just download porn. Right? Well, your first instinct, I've got, I've got internet, what do I do? I look for videos, I look for pornography. Right? So the government is realizing this. Everyone has a different experience of what, or expectation of what's going on. So as long as you still have, uh, we are at this cusp of development, right? you, you, all your talk about fundamental liberties, rights, free and fair election, can it go so far? It goes to all the cities where we are, we are already uh, in favor of uh, the opposition. Uh, in 2008 and in 2013, if you notice uh, electoral trends, almost none of the state capitals was in Barisan national hands. None, except for maybe Kanga. Uh, you know, no, none. Every, every state capital was won by the opposition. That's where the internet is. That's where social media works. That's where all the noise is coming from. So, uh, why some of these guys uh, can't make use of social media is because the ones, the choir is already there. The choir it should be in places where there's not enough people who will still vote them in, vote, vote these guys in. But there, there has no internet connectivity. It, it, uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Mahathir Mohamad, we have a lot of internet in Malaysia. Not as great as Singapore, as James Sin will say, but there is connectivity. Uh, but we don't use it the way you think we should use it. You know, uh, different strata society are using it for entertainment. You know, entertainment is our great opium. Entertainment and religion is our great opium in Malaysia. As long as we have both of that, we have Raja Lawak, uh, to some extent Ezra shows, we get entertained, we laugh, we forget everything. Hey, thanks to this government, we have all this. Let's vote them in again. You know, so that's, so that's one point. Uh, the other one, the other question about race-based uh, politics is, um, and I'm, I'm doing series, a series on this because Malaysia turns 50 this year, is uh, we began as a race-based nation. Uh, we began with a race-based economy. Uh, Malays are agrarian, Chinese are in the cities, the Indians are tapping rubber or their services, professional services, doctors, engineers, and all that. Uh, our parties are still the same. Um, uh, the guys in, in Pakatan are very polite. They don't bring this up. They don't bring religion up because they're in a very uneasy marriage of convenience and inconvenience. You know, we don't think as Malaysians. You know, uh, I think Singaporeans are going to think as Singaporeans. But in Malaysia, we only think we are Malaysian when we are out of this country. Last night we were actually talking about it and, and uh, we were saying, uh, you know, the ISIS guys uh, managed to get three of us. Uh, three Malayus, and, and I'm not Malay. So, so then we said, okay, at least 
three Muslims. Then I said, well, we're not really Muslims, are we? So then we agreed that we are actually three Malaysians. And I'm being very honest about this because this is what we were talking about. Uh, so if anybody wants to quote me, quote me correctly on that. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, so, so this, what's your identity? Um, Race-based politics in Malaysia is coming out again. It's, and this goes to the third question, sir. You are asking about why are we now turning on the Shia Muslims. Uh, we ran out of Jews. It's <laughs> only six million of them, you know. We ran out of them, so... so um, um, Jews, Jews were very... Uh, 2000s. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're in the next decade yeah. now, so... Con consider, consider that, uh, that uh, the Shias to us, and it's not just happening in Malaysia, it's actually seriously happening in Indonesia too. They're persecuting the Shias. Uh, consider them as... Um, in a sense, Jesuits, liberation theology Jesuits, they are challenging the status quo of Sunni Muslims. Um, the Sunni Muslims in our country, when we all Sunni Muslims, uh, are there, Islamism, they have now carved out their own empire on both sides of the political aisle. Uh, they justify the existence of our leaders. You know, So in return, we, we feed them, we, very feudal, we feed them, we nurture them because they, they justify the leadership. No matter how corrupt or how bad you are, at least he prays five times a day. At least he goes to the mosque. You know, that this is the very least a Muslim does. Uh, Aman Accord, I had to Google it when you mentioned it. You know, who knows? You know, and I actually read it. Yes, you're right. But uh, I don't need the Aman Accord to tell me that the Shias are Muslims. They can go to Mecca. Of course they're Muslims. Right? But in Malaysia, they, they, there's no logic to that. The same week we were saying uh, Shia Islam is deviant, the same week we sent our Deputy Prime Minister to Iran for the presidential inauguration. Uh, Khatami has visited our country. I've met him, really nice man. You know, fine robes, what does they say, a very clean face, very, looks very holy. Uh, shook his hand and all that. And, and that's fine at that point in time. Uh, at any time when, when uh, leadership in our country faces a problem, an internal problem, we need a bogeyman. It used to be Singapore, right? And then it's just, you know, Singapore's so close to us now because of Iskandar and all that. Can't keep on, you know, only Mahathir uses the, is, uh, is Mahathir's straw man. It's not Najib's straw man or Abdullah's straw man. Um, Jews. Um, we can't use the Jews because uh, they don't seem to be involved in Egypt, um, you know. Uh, but a, about uh, Muslim Brotherhood, Shia, and all that. So we always need to find an external enemy to unify ourselves. Um, and, and Shia Islam, Shia Islam is the easiest, you know, because we, we've never met. We, we have, a, I think, a higher chance of meeting a Jew now in Kuala Lumpur than a Shia Muslim. But that's wrong. Actually, there are 100,000 of them. There are 100,000 Iranians in Kuala Lumpur. They practice Shia Islam. Um, they have one complaint about Malaysia, that, that we have too many mosques and the prayer calls are too often and, you know, there's no coordinated times, five times a day, but it's a cacophony. They call, actually complain about it, because they only pray three times a day. Uh, <laughs> <you know? laughs> but yeah, so we have 100,000 Shia Muslims from Iran, but we cannot be Shia Muslims. Not that they'll ever know, but we can't, you know. So they use it to say, look, this is an external threat. This will disunite you, this will cleave you asunder. Uh, we need to unite. Because our identity in Malaysia is now as Muslims. We can't say we are Malays. We are so intermixed. If, if you just listen to Ezra, you wouldn't think he's Malay. Uh, you know, he might sound like uh, he's Eurasian or what, with some Malay blood. Uh, so we, we, we have no racial identity. We, we are not yet Malay, Malaysians. So we can only be Muslims. For, for the dominant 60% of us. And, and we can only be Sunni Muslims. If we are any other kind of Muslim, uh, we are not one Islam. I just wanted to add to the Shia Sunni split. I mean, and this is my layman's perspective of it, Hamidi and Jala, you can add in. I, I always see these uh, opportunities for our leaders and religious authorities about you know, Shia Islam. I always look at it sometimes through the lens of, of politics. And for me, it's a very simple case of um, that I think it is almost an open secret that within PASS, within the umbrella that is PASS, um, that you have members and followers who, are, who at least practice Shia traditions. And the way, and 
<coughs> if you were to, well, there's also that assertion that those who are practicing Shia assertions, they're a bit more uh, progressive and more liberal in their policies, in their thoughts, and, it, and basically to disengage the conservative ulama section with the progressives, this is a way in which the government can show their hand, throw a little bomb in there, and disunite it a little bit further. Um, and um, it's just essentially a political strategy to make sure that PASS is as uncomfortable as possible to make sure that their members become even more confused. Uh, and it becomes uh, basically an opportunity to uh, keep the enemy disunited and confused as much as possible while you gather up more followers. And, oh, I have a question on Malaysian translation and um, Indonesian translations. You are right, Indonesian translations are just amazing. Basically, any book uh, that is published in the West in about a period of either the same day of the same publication date or within three months, you have the Bahasa Indonesian version, and it does very well. It does very well simply also because that it's about the economies of scale. Uh, everybody in Indonesia reads, converses, and thinks essentially in Bahasa Indonesia. Um, there's a bit more of a homogenous take on, um, on the language, on, on the consumption of content. In Malaysia, you could, you could be somebody like me who reads Malay and English, but I think in English, uh, and I sort of view content in English and Malay. So my 35 ringgit to buy a particular book is going to be split up between all of these considerations. And this is notwithstanding somebody who went to a vernacular Chinese school or a vernacular Tamil school or, or, or a national school. So the reading demographic is broken up. Uh, and as a result, um, English trans uh, Malay translations never took off. But if it did take off with the existing, I mean, it still is the largest reading market. Uh, all they are reading, and, and which is what my publishing house was trying to address, all they are reading are education books, which is terrific because it, it, it basically is part of the school syllabus and stuff, religious books, um, cooking books. And I say this not to be facetious. I say this because I compete with these books on a best-selling list every week, week in and week out. Oh, I forgot horror books, you know, as well. And I compete with this week in, week out. And at the end of the year, when a biography um, of a famous politician is com competing with um, a religious, I don't want to call him a scholar. What do you call Azhar Idrus? Eh? He's a, a religious entertainer. Or, you know, he comes up with a book at 15 ringgit, uh, 125 ways to become a better Muslim. And one of those ways is not take a peek at your fellow colleague's mini skirt, and that makes you a better Muslim. So that book is selling at 100,000 copies. Mahathir's memoir is dwarfed. Mahathir's memoir is at 50,000. So if Dr. Mahathir and all of his insights and his memoir can only take a crack at Ustaz Azhar Idros, who's got a YouTube channel, he's there in Trunganu uh, for, his for his sermons, and has got a book. He is a media machine. I mean, essentially, what we've seen in the West, in the US, with evangelical churches, you are beginning to see that with imams and ustaz in Malaysia as well. In the mornings during Ramadan, for example, the programming that you're seeing every morning about how to be a better Muslim, cosmetically or in any sort of external sense, it's all, it's all there. Uh, but uh, on that same token, th you know, the double standards of what one person does, whether they are a politician or a person of authority or a member of the royal family, to what a person on the street does, um, the prosecution is different. On, on the point of Indonesian translations, you are right, they are popular. Have they made, can they make their way in Malaysia? They can't. Essentially, there have been attempts by local publishers to cheat or to save money, or to save costs on, on printing. Just bring in the Indonesian translation, change a few words, translate it, and then publish it in Malay. It doesn't quite work. It's, it's not a good read. And Malay readers will say, like, you know, it, it, it just doesn't make sense. Um, it has been a, it's been a strategy that has been employed in the past. It's not been very successful. Basically, the argument is that if you're translating Indonesia to Bahasa Indonesia to Bahasa Malaysia, you might as well translate it from English 
to Bahasa Malaysia because the content will be more appreciable because there's still significantly more words and different terms that we use. Um, and, uh, and I just wanted to add the main point is that on issues of book bans and the reason which part of which why I'm in trouble or what I can conclude is is that when I, the government has this idea that once these ideas of discourse and debate on anything, on religion, on politics, on history, become available in the Malay language, the, the, the Malay populace will crumble in, in, in fear of, of in self-defeat and insecurity. And this takes place also, I imagine, with my show, The Defing Show. If I am doing the content that I currently do in Malay, so what I do on my effing show is I, I introduce things in English, but most of my skits are in Malay. But if it was a full Malay language show, I'm more than certain that I would have been arrested for that many, many years, many, at least two years ago. But because it's in English, I will let Ezra fly. And it's the same reason at BFM radio station. The things that we talk about on air, if it was in the Malay language, I'm pretty sure that BFM would lose its radio license, which has to be renewed every year. And so it is, a, it is this idea that, you know, as long as we can contain them, as long as we can keep ideas out, you know, we've got the Malays covered via, elec uh, via the elections, via uh, their obedience, via education. And uh, I mean, we're, we haven't even spoken about uh, the education policies. We can't even get that right. So yeah, that's on the translation front. Thank you, Ezra. Mm, next round of questions. Uh, we, we have about 10 minutes left. Oh, hi, Cherry, and I'll, I'll come to you in a minute. Um, Miss, you, were, you had uh, your hand up earlier. Hi, uh, I'm Hui Min from my paper. Um, okay. I have a question for Jahabar. Um, what is your prognosis okay, on the future of independent online media in Malaysia in terms of the business sustainability and its role in politics? Because I felt that you seemed rather pessimistic in your talk just now. Okay, uh, and actually, you didn't answer one of the questions from just now from one of the gentlemen about what is the causes of the increasing Islamization in, in Malaysia. Yeah, and I think I'll be interested in the answer. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, Charin and then sir. Uh, if, if I, uh, Cherry and George, if I could uh, return to the topic of um, uh, religious-based censorship and I think what uh, uh, Salman Rushdie recently called uh, a culture of offendedness uh, that he has seen in India as well. Um, I, I would like to probe the, the reasons for it a little more. I mean, of course, I'm fully persuaded that it's pol political more than theological. Um, a, a Malaysian journalist uh, recently uh, suggested to me that uh, one reason for this uh, is that if you hype up these uh, uh, these sorts of instances, like that recent video of the Muslim uh, dog trainer, uh, it could succeed in driving a wedge through uh, uh, between uh, the DAP and PAS. So I'd like to uh, get uh, Wan Hamidi's uh, take on that. You know, does this kind of thing uh, uh, risk uh, you know, uh, cracking that, that uh, alliance? Um, and also, more anecdotally, based on your knowledge of um, uh, your own networks of what might be called liberal or moderates within the uh, Malay and Muslim uh, communities, uh, do you think things have become so unpleasant uh, that the uh, the intolerance that has uh, that is directed against uh, uh, writers, uh, activists, and so on? Um, has actually made it untenable for them to speak out. Do you know of instances where uh, people have decided to just retreat from public space because it's just not worth fighting anymore? Uh, the, the risks to uh, invasions of privacy, to being harassed and so on are so great that uh, people like you, maybe not, or maybe you yourselves, have decided, well, enough is enough. We, we're just going to let these goons and these uh, intolerant mobs take over. Thanks. Sir, you had a question. Thanks. Right. Um, it's something that I actually spoke the, the could, entire Could you panel. introduce yourself? I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Ivan. I'm from sociology here. Um, but basically, my question is about the audience. In a sense, I think all three of you have alluded to some notion of the audience. Uh, my sense is, uh, you know, at least for the first two speakers, my sense is that your idea of the audience is, is someone who is perhaps 
um, rather passive, rather um, you know, uh, uncritical, you know, that they are taken in, in by all these propaganda. I, I wonder if the, the, the three of you could s say more about what you think of the audience, you know, whether in fact uh, the Malaysian audience, having been exposed to all these, all these years, um, are in fact so um, capable, they have the capacity to be critical. In fact, to a point where perhaps they don't care. They don't, you know, they don't see the media online or off media, you know, as the place for serious discourse. Thank you. Okay. Am I, am I pessimistic? No, I'm not pessimistic. Um, there's not enough of us, one. Um, my, my little talk was actually uh, titled Content, Discontent and Malcontents. Simple reason because the malcontents have taken over. They've, they've taken uh, what's being done online. Uh, you know, in the last eight weeks, anything on YouTube, they, they dredge it up. Uh, the Muslim doctrine is from three years ago. Uh, they're dredging it up and giving, using it as an example of, of, um, of a new media and its uh, effect on the country. That, that people are proudly doing all this um, corrupting influence of the West. You know, in, in, in a sense, uh, we in the new media, we are reprobates, we are, we are infidels. Uh, we are the worst of the worst. Uh, you know, we will corrupt this country. So the conservatives, uh, and it's only Utusan, really. They keep, Utusan, the Malaypers keep bringing this all up and, and have made this into the biggest noise that the governor today says, we need to act on this. And, and this goes to Mr. Chair and George's question about uh, are people afraid to speak up uh, what's happening in the country? The thing is, nothing is happening in the country. It's all happening in the newspaper. Right? We are not hounded. I mean, I hope we can go back to Malaysia after this at the airport. We won't be detained. Uh, I'm sure we will. But, you know, I have never received a phone call. I've, we've written so many articles uh, blasting the government, the home minister, this home minister, the previous home minister, never got a call. Because Ezra is right. It's in English. They don't care about us. Uh, there was this deputy home minister, really famous guy. Uh, he, he's died now. Tan Sri Magad Janit Magad Ayub. I, I covered him. I've been a journalist for 26 years. I covered him years ago. And there was this complaint about this little magazine, which doesn't exist anymore, called Men's Review. Um, circulation of 15,000. And they had a lot of risque pictures of women, uh, all kinds of ideas uh, done by this bunch of people I called the Jalan Ampang Gang. Kuala Lumpur is really small. You have the Jalan Ampang gang, all these guys who live in Jalan Ampang. You have the Damansra gang, you have the Bangsa gang. And now with BFM, the hipster gang, they're all around, right? It's okay, right? I call you that. No. Um, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm, so, not, I'm not offended. <laughs> uh, so, so, so when you have all this, they, they control the little discourse in English. I want, I want to study in Australia or in England or in America. Uh, the government of Malaysia, and I asked uh, Dato Magajanit then, aren't you worried? You know, all these things, this, why should we worry? It's in English. Who reads in English anyway? You know, our education system will last 30 years. Everyone reads in Basa. I, when I went to school in Senate 1, 1975, medium of instruction is in Bahasa. Increasingly, we can't find people who can read in English or write in English, let alone either one or. Right? So, they, they're not um, they're not bothered about ideas in English. They're not seriously, you know. Um, they they're not. Uh, they wouldn't have been bothered about Professor James Chin's editing a book on Un Abdullah Badawi, except for those thirty six pages, because it's it was a former former prime minister talking about his time. One thousand copies of the book. They, everyone's scrambling to get a copy of the book. They didn't know what was going on. They just knew, oh, it's a book by him. It's terrible. You know, it's a book in English. No one ever read it yet, and they were already blasting it because they don't know. Right? Um, and because they knew because of online media. Right? So they took whatever we wrote and turned it around. So I'm, my pessimism about online media is simple that, that we are now becoming a pawn in the, in the overall game of, of running Malaysia. Of, of someone, uh, of a government trying to keep power. 
uh, I have no problems with this government keeping power. You know, I, I don't think they'll ever lose power at the rate things are going. I don't think they'll ever lose power. You know, next elections, maybe they'll get 130 seats, you know, but they won't lose power. Uh, and, I, and they won't, um, don't think they'll take action against us because we are nothing. We're nothing to them. The other point about, I didn't answer the question about uh, the causes of the rising Islamism. I think I did. You know, it's about politics, it's about identity. Uh, we seek solace in Islam as a tool not as a faith, uh, in a time of uncertainty. Uh, Islam is, is uh, our identity now, it's our badge. We use it as a currency to trade with, with Muslim states. Uh, for them to come in and invest in Malaysia, who else is going to invest in Malaysia? Right? So Islam is, is our, um, is the only thing we have left. Moderate Muslim nation. The Americans love us for that. Um, but we are not moderate within our own country. We, we, we have people going after him because he's translated a book and it gives ideas to people. So we, we are not moderate inside, but we are moderate outside. So we appeal to everyone. We fantastic country. You know, center of the universe, we're a fantastic country. Uh, and Islam is, is a great religion. It's a religion of peace. You know, uh, we, we're going to demolish a surah now because it was used wrongly. Because it does, it's not hit, it's not facing Mecca, you know. Slightly off. Yeah. Yes. Although, although if you think about it, we don't need a building to face Mecca. We just need to face Mecca. <laughs> it's not the building; it's us, right? So, and, but no one says that, right? Malaysians, Malaysians have a problem. Our problem is we have no moral courage to say, "This is wrong. This is bullshit. Can we start all over again?" That really, all the events in the last two months, in the last 50 years, is a result of no one saying the emperor has no clothes. And, and until that time comes, until Hamidi can convince his colleagues in, in Pakistan to do that, uh, forcefully and stick to that course of action, until the time Ezra can get enough people to publish more books and get people to read these books. Why is he putting it in Bahasa? Because nobody's reading it in English. See, that's the thing. We, we don't ask, right? No one's reading in English. But he can't put it in Bahasa because they know once they put it in Bahasa... They knock on my office door. Yeah, you know, they lose the only semblance of, of, uh, of uh, justification to be our government of the day. So we need to have that moral courage. Uh, and I can say it here, and I'll say this in Malaysia too. Need more online portals. We need more people to read, more people to write. Uh, we need more academics. Mr. Wee was asking me, uh, maybe I'll say something about Malaysian academics. What do you think of them? And I said, I don't. Because they don't. They don't express themselves. They don't want to express themselves. In 500 words at least. In 500 words or less. They might do something in 2,000 words, and, I, and I, by the time I get to the end of it, I don't know what they're saying. You know, so... We, we're just a country, we, we, you know, Malaysia is just like Singapore, well, actually a lot better than Singapore. We are blessed with a lot of things. We've got commodities, we've got bigger talent pool, but our talent pool has become a talent puddle because everyone has left. They're all here. You know, Ms. Jude has been here for 30 years. <laughs> you know, who wants to come back to Malaysia and say, the emperor has no clothes? Three of us. That's it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and any last comments? Uh, yeah. Uh, in addition to that uh, English and Bahasa thing, the print, printed version of the rocket, Bahasa rocket, uh, instead of the English spelling, we have the Malay spelling, <laughs> R-O-K-E-T, in the last 40 years. Since it's been deemed as a Chinese party, you know, English, Chinese speaking, they don't care. But was it last year, two years ago, I received a letter. I ignore the second letter. I couldn't ignore. You have infringed the uh, what do you call it? regulation because you were never registered as R O K E T. <laughs> so meaning that we have to revert to the English spelling because that's the KDN rule. Why? Because after 2008, they are so scared that DAP may be able to convince the Malays. 
Although I use the word they, I don't even know whether they are UMNO, Barisan Nasional, or the uh, Home Minister. So that's the situation with Bahasa and English. So the idea is that keep the Malays away from uh, uh, these kind of ideas in Bahasa. You can do anything in Chinese or, or in English. Okay, that's, that's the, just to share the point. Uh, on the culture of offendedness, yeah, that's the one that we were trying to find uh, last night. I think, yeah, it's true. One of the reasons is to which the, uh, what call it, uh, this thing between PAS and DAP. But as I mentioned earlier, this is a short-term plan from, from Amno BN side. But in the long term, people start believing it. Because, sir, your question just now, you know, yeah, the audience may be critical or, they're, uh, or they are not passive. They just don't care. But the thing is that when you don't care, you don't read about anything, even the, the, the government propaganda, when you sit down at a coffee shop, you tend to talk politics. So where do you refer to? The loud mouth, who actually refers to that? So it goes around and around in race-based thing. I've heard it myself, nothing in particular here, but things like, um, well, he may be corrupt, but at least he's a Malay, so it's okay. You know? Uh, you know, meaning that uh, I'm, I feel secure if my own race is in, in power. Okay? So that's the reason, I think, yeah, the, 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 as I said, the Malays were upset with, with UMNO, people, I mean, uh, uh, abuse of power, corruption, and all that, uh, has a tendency to, to vote for PAS or PKR. But when this driving wedge between PAS and DAP, you know, and everything is, is you are easily offended now, so it's becoming ridiculous now. Okay, not, not to say that it didn't exist, but I think uh, it has gone worse. Okay, pushing people out, well, I mean the AP, am I? <laughs> am I not? Uh, okay. And lastly, uh, yeah, I mean, basically, the, the basic aim is just short term, meaning that to, 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 to reduce the DAP to the level of MCA, so that UMNO can, can, can take on uh, PKR, Anwar Ibrahim, and also that they maintain power. But in the long run, young or old, if you are referring to, to the media or not, but it's the same story still a race-based politics. You cannot escape from that. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't have the formula. But basically, we, we have to fight the good fight. Yes. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, James, you have a quick question? It's not a question. It's just that the lady asked a very important question. Mm. When she talked about sustainability, she's talking about the business model of online portals because as far as we know, right, almost all of them are losing money and a few of them were actually sponsored by by tycoons to set up, but you know, I mean, how do you how do you maintain this in the long run? Okay. Uh, yeah, that's that's very interesting. How can we be sustainable in the long run? Um, you have can, you can have a paywall, um, but paywalls don't work in Malaysia. As I said, you know, uh, a lot of uh, Malaysian portals are the indulgences of tycoons and and uh, a lot of foundations from overseas. Um, for many reasons, okay. Um, there's there's still no viable um, there's still no viable model yet. Ours is 100% advertising. Uh, it it pays for 50% of our operational expenditure, right? Uh, I don't. Uh, I was having a, actually a chat with uh, James just now about it. Uh, none of the portals today can pay back their capital, you know, um, unless they belong to a media conglomerate like um, Media Prima or the Star then they can, you know, you can do cross subsidies. Uh, our market is too small. We're a country of 29 million people. S um, you have a broadband penetration, right? but nobody wants to pay, right? It, it will become sustainable one day when we have maybe 20, 30 news portals, and then the advertising uh, dollars come in. Uh, for example, in 2011, uh, Malaysian edX advertising expenditure was six billion. Uh, internet was just 35 million. That's all. But it is slowly going up. I, you know there's money to be made because Google just set up an office in Malaysia. They just moved to a new office two weeks ago. They f have space for 100 people, all sales. They used to have 60 people for sales. Um, the um, YouTube.com.my, the Malaysian YouTube, gets 2 million unique visits a day. Uh, they are making money in a very micro way, but cumulatively they're making money. Uh, Google is a, one of those who, um, again, example, when I came into Insider in 2010, uh, we were generating a thousand US dollars a month from Google AdSense. 
um, for me during the general elections in in Malaysia, I got a check for thirty thousand US, which is a lot of money in the Malaysian context. That's that's close to a hundred thousand ringgit. That's one third of my OPEX for that month. Actually, well, less than one third because you spend more during elections. But uh, and then in June we've got we got about uh, twenty five thousand. So the money is incrementally going up. The revenue is going up. We're getting more advertisements, um, but you won't be able to make your money in the first decade. You can't. Uh, our satellite TV operator Astro took seven years to break even, and they only broke even because they gave away the decoders for free. When it first came to the market, you were, we had to pay eighteen hundred ringgit for a decoder plus your services, which was 50 ringgit a, a month. Sorry, uh, decoders 1,800, and you pay 50 ringgit a month. When they started giving out their decoders for free, the set-top boxes, subscription just went up. Now they have 3 million subscribers. Um, last year, they spent 1.3 billion just to buy sports rights. Uh, and I'm sure Singaporeans are familiar with this because uh, for a time, you didn't have EPL. You know, we pay top money just for football. Uh, but they can do it. But, but this year... Nobody wants to play, pay for football because you can get it online. You can get a lot of free telecasts. We can get cricket now for free. The market is all coming online. So advertisers are now going online. Right? We, are all, we, we are there early. We staked our... It's gold rush. We're staking our claims. Okay? We've got the eyeballs now. We, we started on our first day of service in two, 2008, February 25th. We only had 46 visits. Uh, 46 visits, 150 page views. Every person only read three pages. Well, we only had three pages anyway. Mm -hmm. But now, we have a, a daily unique visit of about 150 to 200,000. And page views of uh, between 1.2 million and on a fantastic day, 1.8 million. Election night, we had, had 3.5 million page views. I just kept pressing on the results. So it's a, it's a function. You, you, need to, you need to keep putting out the pages and get people to read it. And then the, the advertising dollar kicks in and, and uh, people will pay. But our, our business is so... Um, everyone's undercutting each other. Malaysia Kini, because they get grants, they're offering ads of, say, uh, for their Bahasa, which is free, 2,000 ringgit for three weeks. 2,000 ringgit for three weeks. You know, that's, that's uh, Singapore dollar today, that would be uh, 800 sing for two weeks. Can't pay for anything. I charge 4,005 a week. So three weeks, you, get, you pay for three weeks, you get for one month, you get one week free. We're trying to undercut each other going after this market. So advertisers know that. So they're just offering us minimum because we're desperate for money. We are not sustainable in the short, medium term. But we can toughen it out. We are, we are keep being the indulgences of tycoons and foundations for at least 10 years, just like in America where not-for-profit not, not uh, foundations are funding fantastic and good journalism, then it will be okay. We don't appreciate fantastic and good journalism in Malaysia. We don't. We don't, we don't appreciate long form. We don't have the patience. Um, we, I mean, so few of us subscribe to New York Times or Singapore Straits Times. Some of us have to read Singapore Straits Times to know more about our country, but not about Singapore, fortunately. Don't, we just, you know, but Singapore is also changing. Uh, you have new websites like the, the Rail Singapore. I don't know how many of you read the Rail Singapore. It's a massive review. You know, right, this website called the Rail Singapore? You don't, right? It's a fantastic website. I'm giving it publicity. Uh, it's a very grassroots, very organic view of, of Singapore. Really different from ST and, and, and your paper, any kind of paper. Right? But that is a blog of sorts. It's cited overseas. It's not under your laws. Uh, you know, a bunch of passionate people that you were talking about. They're not a critical audience. The audience is critical, but they're not of a critical mass. That's the problem. That's a problem. In Malaysia, they're not of a critical mass. There's so few of them who hang out with him or hang out with me or Hamidi. Very few of us. But it's, it's also about, I guess, just to end on it, it's also this, we've spoken a lot about courage and moral courage to, I mean, it's it also to the extent that even if they are consuming that content, there is still a, 
there is still a sense of um, where the community judges you, whether you share or retweet a particular bit of content that is outside of the orthodox. Even that act alone, a retweet is so important and so big, but yet it is so detrimental to their, I guess, own being within their own community. I guess there, there's a lot of, um, what's the word? It's not judging, but I mean, it's, 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 it's almost constantly within the sphere of your own community. It's very, very difficult to do. I have many, many people in the entertainment business in Malaysia who watch that effing show. And they come up to me and all these top comedians, they say, hey, great show. And this person on Twitter alone has 500,000 viewers. This other person has 1.2 million. And they love that effing show. But, it's they, but they always come up to me very politely and say, Ezra, you know, I can't retweet that. You know, I can't retweet the show. I just can't. I just don't know how. And it, it is it's because of that. It is this moral courage and it's also the quantity and numbers in which let alone go to the Malaysian Insider, people who want to read content in the rocket, people are tuning to BFM. It is, it is almost so difficult to come up and say, hey, this is really interesting. This is, I share some of these views. What do you think? Those three sentences and to articulate them, to share them within the context of Malaysia right now is proving to be more and more challenging. Okay, I think I'll have to stop here, although I could... Well, personally, I want to go on for another hour or so. But we'll... we'll would I'm sure I want to invite you back in the future again, if you're willing. Um, shall we thank them all before we, we break for lunch? Thank you.